Welcome to another episode of our Six Questions podcast. I'm Trent England with Save Our States. Thanks so much for being among our uh, many listeners and viewers out there. We have a really special program today. We are talking with Jerry Lehman. He is a commercial fishing boat captain and an advocate for the fishing industry. He lives in Maine and fishes out of Massachusetts. Jerry, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for taking the time to, to do this. Um, I know we, we had to catch you when you're, you're not out at sea. And the first question is, just tell us a little bit about what it's like to work as a, a captain in the commercial fisheries. Well, these days, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a multi-hat industry. I mean, uh, pretty much, uh, you got to look at policy and regulation, figure out what you're allowed to catch based on quota. Um, and then you got to put together a crew that's pretty much knowledgeable enough to go not get themselves killed while we're out at sea at 10 days at a whack. Um, here I do multi-species commercial fishing. So that's a year round basis. So there is no seasonal time for us. It's just go, um, pretty much when we're out there, we're the ones chasing down the haddock that everybody sees at the restaurants locally, uh, pollock, redfish, dabs, monks, um, multi-range of species. Uh, we also harvest federally lobsters too, dragged lobsters, which are federally permitted uh, offshore. So we are allowed 500 pieces of those. So it's a multifaceted fishery. And uh, that's a perfect lead into the second question, which is there's there been a lot of controversy around the lobster fishing industry and the Biden administration has proposed some rules that would really have a draconian effect on Maine's, you know, lobster fishing industry, which is something that, that, you know, goes back uh, for a long time. It's a big part of the state. What uh, I mean, talk about that a little bit. And then, I mean, one of the interesting twists on this and the reason I've been been following this debate a little bit more closely is that uh, some of the folks who don't like the Electoral College have blamed the Electoral College for giving Maine's lobster industry too much of a voice in national politics. So uh, talk to us about this whole issue. This is a this is a debate that, you know, has huge effects in the Northeast, but really affects the whole country, I think. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is going to go right out across the communities. I mean, this goes directly to the commerce of all your local coastal communities here in New England. I mean, if we think about it, I mean, the, the, the entire setup of fishing here as our nation was started was based on fishing industry. That was the first fundamental start of our nation and our, our security as a nation to be able to live here on this land. I mean, when the people landed on Plymouth Rock, they didn't plant corn and had corn on the cob for dinner. You know, the, the the sea was was a big vital key point in our in our in our commerce. I mean, at one time, codfish was a monetary system for our nation. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason they called it green gold. Uh, yeah, Cape Cod. I mean, Cape Cod, the funding states, the founding states, and everything else. I mean, the, 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 these were. Uh, a forefront for everything that we based our commerce on and from there we've branched out over the years and now it's like we're importing 92 percent of our seafood and, and in the meantime i mean we're the most regulated fishery in the world i mean we're environmentally friendly friendly we're, we're sustainable um, we bend over backwards to make sure that we're bringing high-end sustainable food to our nation and in the meantime, just the regulatory policies, especially with the Biden administration pushing these agendas for the Green Deal, uh, it, it's a conflict of interest due to the point that we have two opposing bodies wanting the same, using the same resource of land, which is the ocean. Uh, I mean, you're fundamentally going to be putting wind turbines in. I mean, it, it, it's, it's going to be devastating. It's going to be devastating for the commerce, the local communities. I mean, people, when they come up to Maine, and I mean, they would consider vacation land. I mean, if you're going to come up here, you're going to be eating imported fish from other nations. You're not going to see the coastal communities because there won't be any left. I mean, you're fundamentally going to kick the people from their homes, from their livelihoods, and then you're going to tell them to buy green wind. Well, how yeah. do you buy green wind when you don't even have any... Um, any funding for it. I mean, you, you're going to be taking the paychecks from the mouths of the working class people. And then what are you going to offer them? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. 
And, and what is this? I mean, this new issue has popped up specifically around lobster. What's what's going on there? I mean, has has anything changed other than the politics of it all? Oh yeah, well, it's just politics, and it's a virtue signaling from the White House. You know, you got Bowie um, working with Noah now. I mean, the data is 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 not logical from a fishery standpoint, at least at least from my end. Um, and now they're, they're they're pushing these regulations. So pretty much is they're going to boot a majority of the folks off the water. You know, these are the people that are dependent, living paycheck to paycheck, some of them. I mean, some of them have vital businesses that flourish. I mean, you're talking about people that have invested their house, their families, their lives, their wharfs, their boats, everything is tied into this. And now you are just going to crush these folks. I mean, I mean, just from a standpoint financially, I mean, I don't know how the banks are going to feel about 4,000 lobstermen with a bunch of notes and who's going to pay for that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, you you alluded to the the whole issue of you know green energy, wind energy, these big offshore wind turbines, and all this. I mean, it's fascinating to me. And and this is the next question. It seems like so many of the efforts for you know combating climate change and preserving the environment wind up harming the environment. Sometimes in really obvious ways, like throwing up all of these wind turbines. I mean, how do you see it as someone who lives and works right there? I mean, why why do things get so out of balance where you have people who claim to be environmentalists who are then pushing things that arguably are, are pretty environmentally harmful? Well, that's funny you said that because most environmentalists sit behind a desk and make policy and regulation using lawyers. And in the meantime, the fishing community has been at sea for, well, generations now. I mean, these are these the ideologies of the fisheries has been passed down from generation to generation. I mean, the only way you become a good fisherman and sustainably harvestable so you can keep going back to these same resources in the environment. I mean, we're not here to devastate the environment. I mean, if we devastated the environment, how would we ever go back out and, re and, and, and continue our livelihoods? I mean, that it directly goes against everything that a fisherman is about. Uh, and in the meantime, you got environmental groups talking about wind turbines, about the water temperatures warming and everything else. And in the meantime, if people actually look at the science behind wind turbines, they're literally going to heat the water from the bottom up. Uh, uh, I mean, you're calling cooling systems. I mean, the, the cables and everything else put off high output of heat. And it's like, well, the whole idea of putting these things in, well, the argument was, was our oceans warming and our fish stocks and our populations are dropping. It's like, well, that's funny because I'm seeing more fish now than I did 20 years ago. Yet you're telling me that the climate's warming, but I'm seeing more fish. And yet the whole idea behind wind turbines was to, to sustain us. And in the meantime, you're restricting everybody. It's not, it, 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 the, the, the two entities are clashing with each other severely yeah. it's not making any sense it's just round and round and round virtue signaling and at the end of the time i mean what are we talking about we're talking about corrupting the commerce we're talking about destroying blue collar working lives uh, we're talking about destroying communities uh displacing people uh displacing heritages mm -hmm. i mean this is so anti-american anti-environmentalist i mean this is just it's not even green I mean, I mean, everything that you said, the reason was behind it is you are directly doing it. It's like it doesn't make any sense, to, at least to no fisherman that I have been aware of. And I've, I've talked to him quite a few over, over the last few months. I mean, like I said, I've been in every major fishing port here in New England for the last 22 years. I mean, I've never even met a NOAA agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're probably better off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, unfortunately, but that's the, I think that's a lot of the problem is this disconnect. You got people yeah. talking. It, it, it's about jobs and, and, and about creating, you know, the, yeah. the, there's a percentage of people that are going to be making bank on this and it's not the working class. Yeah, it, it, this is this is you I mean, you're talking money, it, it, the, the government's money and then the taxpayers money is going to be subsidized to other nations to, to give us energy sources. How does that make any sense? Yeah. I, I'm talking here on our Six Questions podcast with Jerry Lehman. He is a commercial fishing boat captain and an advocate for the fishing industry up in New England. Jerry, the next question actually is specific to Maine. I have to ask this because, you know, we, we're focused at Save Our States on preserving the Electoral College. Maine does something that is unique. Only one other state divides up its electoral votes by congressional districts so that 
Each congressional district in Maine chooses one presidential elector, and then the statewide vote uh, selects the other two. What do you think of that system? Is that a good system to represent Maine people? Well, in theory, I mean, it, it makes both parties more inclined to pay attention to the state. I mean, this way, it's not just one-sided party rule, you know, then it just gets right off track. This way, I mean, in theory, they're, they're supposed to be paying attention to every fundamental reasoning behind it, everything that each party wants to do with the state. And I think that's a good thing at the moment. Uh, as far as electoral college with popular votes, I mean, I think that would just more marginalize, you know, the attention. I mean, fishermen already have a hard enough time getting attention from anybody. I mean, pull, it's like pulling teeth trying to get a political party to, to just even to take a gaze at us. I mean, pretty much the fishing industry has been put on a back burner and it, 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 it's, a, it's a true crime as far as yeah. I'm concerned. Yeah. So the, uh, yeah, I, you know, I grew up out on the Puget Sound in Washington State and uh, have seen the, the fisheries sort of come and go there. But what was really impactful back in the 90s is what they did to the logging industry, which seems really similar to what they're trying to do to the fisheries right now. I mean, that there are a lot of logging towns or towns that used to be, you know, timber towns in Washington State and in Oregon that were just wiped out because of this sudden radical swing toward conservation uh, that, that in the end was based on sort of phony, you know, supposedly scientific rationale about spotted owls that was later, you know, largely disproven and all this. Yeah, it's, and it really is frightening to see that now they've turned their sights on the fishing industry after seeing what they've done to, you know, to other other industries like like timber, which also pushes up the price of, of homes for people. And, you know, you go after fisheries, you push up the price of food. And I, I thought the Biden administration was trying to combat inflation, but it doesn't seem like they're, they're trying to do that in this case. No, no, it doesn't seem like they're doing it at all. I mean, like I said, if you look at all these vital communities, I mean, the waterfront along here in New England was the starting point for our nation's fisheries. You know, these things have been in place since the start of our country. And yeah. now we're just pushing everything to the wayside. So the fundamental grouping that actually helped strengthen our nation and our security is now in jeopardy. Yeah. Uh, I've been trying to tell everybody plainly, it's just like, well, just imagine this, we're importing 92% of all of our seafood from overseas. So what happens, we have an economic downturn I go and every other nation decides, well, their resources are better to stay at home. So what do we do? I mean, we're, White House sits there and talks about food shortages right there on national TV in front of everybody. And in the meantime, processing plants, I mean, the train spill, I mean, the Midwest regions talk about dropping down farming this year because of contamination. So it's now really a good time for us as far as the national security wise, as far as food consumption for our people. Is now the time for this? I don't think it is. So Jerry, the, uh, the fifth question of our six questions you have been a uh, you, you've been out there on the water for decades and a, a captain of a fishing vessel. What what is your closest call? What's your most harrowing sea story that you can share with us? Oh, we were in a storm a few years back, and uh, like most storms, I mean, generally when it gets too bad to fish, I mean, I'm on a tank for the most part. She's a 94 steel drag Western rig stern trawler. Uh, you know, it was probably blowing a good 50, 60 knots. You know, it was probably a good 22 foot C, 24 foot C on average. You know, we point the bow up into it and you just jog, try to just stay idle, you know, so you're not thrashing around too badly, more than you already have to. Uh, uh, I've been going along like that for about a good seven or eight hours. The storm was only going to push through about 16. So, me looking at that, well, it takes me 16 hours to get back to shore. So, if I go to shore and I come back 16 hours, now I wasted a day and a half. So I just usually stay, especially if the storms are going to be quick passerbys. That way I stay right on top of the grounds. Well, I ended up putting a watch up on, I don't know, I thought it was at the end of the, the next tide when they were starting to dissipate. Well, a rogue wave came, hit us from the side like a freight train. You know, I'm a steel boat. I mean, it hit us so hard, it pretty much flipped the boat almost upside down. So as I was laying in my bunk, which is in the wheelhouse, top end of the boat, top deck, I'm on the ceiling looking up at the bunk. <laughs> And of course, by then the generators and everything, the lights are all flashing, you know, it's a quite the attention getter. So yeah. you're sitting there to yourself. It's like, well, do I take a deep breath? 
uh, what's going on? And luckily, well, another one must have hit the keel and sent the boat back the other way. And of course, it gets real eerie in the middle of the night when the lights are flashing and all yeah. your creaking of the steel. In the meantime, you're sliding around the walls. <laughs> well, we came back up. The boat actually corrected itself. I was able to make my way out of the bunk room, kick the throttle, get the boat turned over to shed some of the water, which corrected the course. But when I went out on the deck, I mean, the entire 45 feet of the entire steel plate along the side of the rail was all bent inside of the boat. Oh, wow. Five, and you're talking inch and a half steel plate on the gates, and that was bent around like pretzels. Wow. So pretty much equivalent of getting hit by a train in the middle of the night out of out of the go out of the going and you know what these are these are these are risks that you know in the back of your mind or every fisherman i mean whether you're inshore or offshore these things are real they are considered the one of the more dangerous occupations in the world commercial fisheries has always been ranked right up there you can go to gloucester massachusetts they have an entire wall of list of names of men and women who were perished at sea providing the u.s consumer you know top-notch protein that's sustainable and it's been passed on from legacy from heritage to heritage for many generations and now it just seems like in the forefront where we're in i mean these these climate this climate agenda and everything else has pushed this all to the wayside where i mean fundamentally it's it's we're being pushed out yeah you know and and, it's, and like i said i mean you're talking uh, thousands i mean if not millions along the coast i mean that that depend on these things you know it, it's it's our national heritage crying out loud in here right here in the united states i mean everybody has a fishing story i mean everybody will have, has spent time on the water you know i mean it's, it's a it's a fundamental part of being an american and, yeah. and and now it's just it's it's been corrupted it's being corrupted and and, and, and there's quite a very many of us in the same idea as me we're just tired of it we're tired of it we're tired of being pushed to the side we're, I mean, we're not even allowed to have dictation in our own livelihoods anymore. We are so overregulated in policies. It's just, it's, 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 it's gone insane. I mean, I have to be half a lawyer, half a shrink, you know, half a mechanic, you know, and, and, and it's just balls in the air at all times, you know, and the variables change depending on the weather and, you know, the sleep deprivation and everything else for what we do. It's not like we work nine to five. When we go out, it's go, go, go go until the job is done and then you go home as long as you do everything safely as you can and yeah. hopefully they knock on what is the one piece at the end of the week yeah you mentioned just the 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 american heritage that we have of fishing i know reading about the american revolution the 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 marblehead men were always you know some of the some of washington's most faithful troops and uh you know instrumental to crossing the Delaware and, and, uh, and, and all of that. The, the last question for our first time guests on six questions is always, uh, Jerry, who is your favorite founding father and why? Well, I think the favorite founding father would have to be George Washington. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the, the Mount Vernon estate, I mean, they even still have the salt house that still stands on the North Lawn is still pre-existing. I mean, they used to do seasonal fishing with shad and herring using rowboats. Pretty much it was the start of, some would say it was either the start of gill netting or it could have been the start of, I mean, multifaceted fisheries. I mean, pretty much it's a founding idea of how to corral fish to harvest. You know, these, the, the, and he used to keep top notch with his product. I mean, he used to sell it to the British Isles in Jamaica where he would end up with twice as much profit as everybody else for his fish. So not only was he trying to fish sustainably and seasonally and harvesting high end protein for, for as a resource, but I mean, he also perfected a lot of these methods too. I mean, for back then, I mean, salting fish, I mean, that was a staple. I mean, salt yeah. caught here in New England was a staple for many, many years. I mean, that's what sustained this. Uh, and I think that's a great thing that people should really understand that, I mean, fishing has been a fundamental part of our nation and the creation of our livelihoods since the beginning. I mean, civilization, even out West, I mean, it's a high end protein. There's no GMOs, no chemicals. I mean, it's sustainable, environmentally friendly. Like I said, fishermen have to go back to these same environments. So why would we destroy an environment you have to go back to? To, yeah. to harvest again that's what the sustainability and that's what that's that's a national security thing 
you know, and like I said, with these wind turbines going in, it directly is going to have effect against those. And that, that's, that, that is something that really needs to be brought up. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. It's really, uh, it's really interesting to learn more about this industry. And, and I think, you know, we, we all, we all sort of have a sense that we're, you know, that, that we become overregulated, but folks like you are really out there on the front line of this, right? When you're in a, in an industry that already has so many challenges, as, you, as you've talked about, and then you have government come along and make things so much more difficult. Uh, you know, I, I just hope that our listeners and viewers have gotten a sense of just how dangerous it is to have government out there, you know, as you mentioned, these folks who spend, you know, nine to five sitting at a desk who don't really understand what you do, uh, trying to tinker with your livelihood and, and in effect with these, you know, this entire industry that runs throughout our, our coastal towns in the United States. So thank you so much for being on the program. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Thank you for having us. Uh, I do. Uh, much appreciated. Yeah. Uh, and, and thanks to all of you, our listeners and viewers out there. Uh, we are, are so grateful to have you as part of our Save Our States family as we are defending this constitutional system of federalism that we have, particularly the Electoral College that protects the integrity of our presidential elections, that provides checks and balances in our national politics. You can find out more at SaveOurStates.com. Of course, you can find us on social media. I'm Trent England for Save Our States. Until next time, uh, we will uh, we will we'll be sending out updates across our social media channels, and I hope you're signed up for our email alerts as well. Thank you.